just wanted to pick up on the issue that a few of you are facing with the tutorial that uh, you have made this week for assignment. The issue is uh, this of the zero order reaction and, and getting negative concentrations when you start to simulate. So let's just talk about it. This uh, code up here is not um, the code for the for the tutorial, but it is a, a piece of code that shows exactly what the problem is and in a smaller context so that you can understand the problem. So here, this is an example, this is, so I'll emphasize again, this is not the tutorial, but it's an example that shows the same issue as in the tutorial. The issue is that if I've got two reactions to CA by T, and I've modeled it by minus K on CA, and if I have another reaction, V, that's going to be created, so in other words, A goes to V, but then I've got V, this one is zero order. So this is K1, and this is K2. So the first reaction, A is going to be in the that form rate, and B is then going to products. So B has two components when we're modeling it. It's going to have one show D being created, but then B is also being defeated in a zero order fashion. So we've got your E going away in that form. Our initial conditions, two ODEs, two initial conditions, so CA at time equal to zero. Let's just put it at 3.5 for arbitrary value, and CB at time zero, zero. Now, take a look at what the differential equation means, right? When you put these, these sorts of things into software, understand what you're dealing with. This shows that B's concentration, if this term over here on the right hand side is negative, it's telling you that B's concentration is depleting, going lower and lower and lower. Okay. Notice then this term K2 has no concentration components after that. Right? So we normally used to have uh, K's multiplied by concentrations, but for the zero order reaction, if you wanted to, you could write it as CB to the power of zero, essentially, it's a, a one. Okay, so it goes away. But what will end up happening is you can get negative concentrations being created in that level polymath. So if this term K2 is allowed to go excessively to zero. So in other words, if I had no B in the system, and the ODE on the right hand side here has a negative coefficient, so K1CA, in other words, is smaller than K2. This term over here on the right hand side is negative. The software is seeing essentially PCB by T is less than zero. Now the software has no idea that CB, the concentration, must be zero or, or greater. Right? So the software has no, no conceptual idea of what CB is. You know, of course, that a concentration can never be negative. But the software does not know that. And so the software will give you back negative concentrations, which is probably unreasonable. So one way to guard against that is if you were doing this in MATLAB. So I actually do recommend, despite the polymath being fairly easy to use, I do recommend that you do use a tool like MATLAB or Python in this course instead. Because Polymath is making things part of you, hiding these sorts of details behind the scenes. With MATLAB, you've actually got some explicit control over the issue. What's going on here in MATLAB, if you wanted to simulate this, you would write in your code, MATLAB code, you would write something along the lines of, so I'll write this in pseudo code, so if C is greater than or equal to zero, then you can write DCB by T is equal to K1CA minus K2. Because that makes absolute sense that your, as long as CB is positive or zero, that that term holds. However, if, if MATLAB starts to try to create negative concentrations, so the distribution of here doesn't hold anymore, then set the path to the limit of CB with respect to time equal to zero. That's the only sensible thing. That's exactly what would happen in a real system. We know that we cannot get negative concentrations. And so the rate of depletion of the, that's 
exactly what this term says here. What is the rate of change of E over time? Well, if there's no B around to react, the rate of change of E with respect to time is zero. In other words, it's just a flat line, a horizontal line. Okay, so that's that lab code. Polymax code is a little bit more convoluted. You can create this kind of equivalent by writing the following. K2 is equal to, as you say here, CB, open brackets, CB is greater than or equal to zero. Then K2 is equal to 0.1. So K2 is a great, great constant over here, so I didn't um, pick up here initially with this. So K1 is equal to 0 0.3, K2 is equal to 0 0.1. So as long as the concentration is positive or zero, then K2 is equal to 1, else, and this is why polymath gets messy, else, well, what do we have to do? We have to try and make this term over here equal to zero in the condition when CB is smaller than zero. But the way we can do that is we can just try to negate what's on the right hand side there. So else set it equal to K1 times CA. But it seems kind of weird. You set K2 equal to K1 times CA. But the reason why you do that is so that these terms cancel out and you effectively get a zero over there on the right hand side. Okay, so let me demonstrate that for you in polymath. So if I naively go and code up this system as shown over here on the left boards, so there's my first ODE in its initial condition, three and a half, the second ODE, and its initial condition is zero, my two rate constants, and I've integrated from time zero to 40. If I just naively go and do that, you immediately see the problem. I run the code, I get negative concentrations. So let me just uh, tidy up this axis here to emphasize that. Well, actually, it's a little easier. Let's just go look at the data table. So K2 starts off at zero, goes up. Then eventually, we get start to see negative concentrations occur over here. Right? And time onwards. So clearly, it's a nonsensical output. So then, implement the strategy I described over there, where you try to create a fake rate constant, K2, that is the real value under, under the conditions where it's normal but under these conditions where, you, where the socket tries to send the concentration negative, then you create the effective zero on the right hand side. Can you just put No, but you will in the project. Yeah. And in future tutorials and assignments, so absolutely. So then let's go, to go run that code, so I'll just update it for you. So notice here polymath is, um, I've written it across multiple lines. Polymath, you would write this in one line. If CV is greater than zero, then point one, you can choose, put that in brackets, you don't have to, else the rest. So I'll post this code on the course website so you don't need to copy it down and, and generate errors. Now if I run that, I get what I expect that I go, my CV goes up, and then when it hits that constraint where it tries to set it to negative, it flat lines as, as it should. And it, Let's verify the data table as well. The CV goes up, 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 and as it starts to trend down, it gets to effectively zero. Okay, so minus 1.5 to minus 11, basically zero. So that's kind of a trick you have to do for the tutorial. Also related to the tutorial, people were asking about the volume of the human body. Um, I had mentioned in the tutorial on Monday's group that we know that the volume of blood in the human body is approximately 6 liters. Yet the tutorial is talking about 45 liters. So where's that discrepancy coming from? And do we need to account for it? Well, no, let's read the question carefully. It says the blood, sorry, the drug is effective when a concentration of 0.4 milligrams per liter of body fluid is maintained. Okay, so it's the concentration of the drug in the entire body fluid. The body fluid of 45 liters, I mean, like 85, 80, 85 kilograms myself. So it says about half my body is fluid, and that's about right. I've got bone, which the drug is not in, but it's the tissue of the muscle, the blood, plasma, water, other parts where the drug can penetrate. That's what the 45 liters is. Okay, so don't try to create a model for the blood separate from the rest of the body. 
It's a model with just a single volume of 45, degree, uh, 45 liters. So in this tutorial, I, the reason I'm just kind of give, basically giving you the answer here of what 45 liters is, it's a single batch reactor of 45 liters. So take your body, it's a single batch reactor. There's nothing flowing into me, nothing flowing out, it's steady state. So it's, it's a fixed 45 liters. Okay, so you kind of all struggled through the tutorial on Monday and Tuesday and worked out the issues. So it's, I don't really care that you know now what the answer is, but if you, if you didn't try to struggle through the issues, well, there you go. Um, that's fine if you haven't really learned anything or figured out what's going on in there. Okay, so make sure when you build your model, it's a single volume of 45 liters. So when you swallow that drug, 300 milligrams, the assumption is it's dispersing through that 45 liters instantaneously and goes to 300 milligrams divided by 45 liters. No, because then you're saying K2 is equal to zero. Yeah. But there's still a K1CA there. Yeah, but when CA and KB like go to zero, okay. I'm also asking you. I don't yeah, know. yeah, no, no, that's a good question. You know, that's because I also thought the same thing initially. So it's um well, it's not a good question because they thought the same thing initially. I thought <laughs> that that would also try to work, but it's not. It's a numerical issue. So what happens is L0, if you run it, it just sits there and hangs. It never actually converges. It's just running into numerical issues. It tries to come down, and it's getting to a point that it's seeing a non-smooth non -smooth and it can't actually integrate beyond that point. So it's basically stuck right there. So here, this progress bar shows you the progress between 0 and uh, um, it's going up to 40. So it's right about at 35 that it's getting stuck, which is that inflection, sharp inflection point. Numerical integration don't like sharp things like that. Right? Uh, when you use the stiff, like the, if you change it from one like, branch uh, to the stiff. stiff one, we found it could converge. Okay, so let's try this. Stiff. Okay, so that works. And let's just check numerically. Okay, so it's doing the same thing, but uh, my only concern here is I'm, I'm seeing a little bit of dithering here, but it's small, so it's not probably not a big issue. This, this, yeah, there's, there's a, that's a good approach actually, like, and that's the reason why it got stuck there initially with the wrong cut is because it doesn't see that this well, it sees the discontinuity and it tries to integrate, and make the if you remember from your three D course, it tries to shorten up the interval, and so it's just doing that an infinite number of times and it can't get convergence. But stiff methods try to handle that more elegantly, and this one gets past that issue. Okay, so that, there you go, there's one off. Now, another issue related to the tutorial is how do you simulate the person taking a drug at multiple times during the day? All right, so let's think about that. We've got a batch reactor, the person's body, and we've got 45 liters. Periodically, we're adding material into the batch. So it's so kind of like adding a small tablet into a batch and it's dispersing. How are you going to simulate that in polymer? Has anyone got to that point in the tutorial? How did you end up doing it? Because you're a coach? We can do it, but we can use an if statement where you could like, uh, like use a numerical value that would, uh, like in your differential equation, that would like have a value. Uh, only one, like you, you keep it zero, like normally, and then you could so like make switch it. On yeah, if you yeah. could switch it on and off, like you would add some like amount, some like flat amount, which would represent the dose, but you okay. could make uh, fewer problems. Okay, Nicole? Um, it's sort of like you each section in your input the drug is a separate integration for OD, like run it for a certain time for it to integrate, and then run it for another time for it to integrate, and just add it all to Oh, and then you build up your graphs yeah. slowly. Okay, that's a, that's a good approach. So you just basically start at time zero, taking the first drug, integrate up till like say so six hours yeah. and then you start over again and you push those graphs together and you build up your solution. Okay, that's a neat approach. Um, I would like to maybe show you another approach along the lines that was just suggested that the reason why I want to show you this approach is because we'll actually look at this later on in the reactor design section when you look at non-ideal reactors. And one way to see this is if you go right back to the very first class we had on batch reactors and you, and you look at the derivation for batch reactors, you do the mole balance, we had Fj0 minus Fj plus Rj times V is equal to Tnj by Dt. So 
let us write back at the very first week or two of the course. And what we had done is for batch reactors, we said, well, batch reactors never have flow in and flow out, and we set those two to zero. And I forgot about them ever since. But here we really have to actually take this flow into account. Fj zero does exist in this, we're taking tablets periodically. So what happens is you can simulate this as follows. Let's just uh, put up some units here. Nj, I'm going to say is milligrams. Okay, so this is milligrams per unit time. Fj then must have units of milligrams per unit time. So let's take it milligrams per hour for simulating hours. Now, we know also that Fj, if we go look back earlier, is equal to the concentration, so I'll just call the C drug, concentration of the drug, multiplied by the volumetric flow rate Q. So this is milligrams per liter, and Q is liters per hour, if we're looking at units. So I could substitute in Fj, let's just say Fj0, Fj is the flow out, so we can set that to zero. But Fj flow in is equal to the concentration of the drug multiplied by some flow rate. Now, what's a flow rate suitable? Well, this is exactly where we can use this on-off idea that Spencer suggested. So I write that to zero. The flow into the batch reactor. Flow to zero. Mm -hmm. Flow in. Okay. Flow out. So the batch reactor, we've got well mixed is Fj0 and Fj. Normally we've set those to zero, both because battery are flow and flow in and out. So Fj0 flow in, well we said let's multiply Fj0 out into its constituent components as the drug's concentration multiplied by the flow rate Q. Well the flow rate Q can be considered somewhat type, kind of taking a glass of water every few hours with the drug in it. Well one way to, to do that is to simulate it as follows. Let's take Q, and at a particular point in time, Q here goes up as they take the quantity of water. So let's just arbitrarily assume one liter per hour. So at a very short time frame, and I'll zoom this in for you, let's just say arbitrary, um, for some for the purposes of this example, let's say this is at, at four hours. One way you can simulate this is, let's say that's 3.95 hours and this is 4.05 hours. So during that 0.1 hour period, the person takes a glass of water with a tablet and it goes into the batch. It's a small amount of water, so small that it doesn't really disturb the total volume. Okay, so the volume is pretty much consumed in so, if we take water at one liter per hour, but we're only taking it over this 0.1 hour period, essentially the volume of liquid we're adding is equal to one liter per hour multiplied by 0.1 hours. So we've, we've swallowed liquid at about 0.1 liters of water. So it's 100 milliliters of liquid into the system. It doesn't really disturb the total volume. What we need to have, though, is we need to make sure that the total mass of drug going in, what is this concentration of drug coming in? We know that the amount of drug being swallowed is 300 milligrams, but if we're swallowing it with 0.1 liters of water, that total amount of drug being dosed is 300 milligrams per liter. Well, C drug then needs to be in the 3,000 milligrams. is 3,000 milligrams per liter multiplied by 0.1 liter. That's going to be the simulation of adding 300 milligrams into the batch, into the person's body. Okay, so at between time 395 and 4.05, the person is going to take, take that particular drug. So now if I write my batch reaction out, this is uh, what was suggested earlier. You would simply modify your, your batch reaction. So let's go back 
all the way to my original derivation there was E and J or D and A by DT is equal to RJ times V or RA times V I should say this is plus FA naught. So that's the concentration of drug added. That can be written as DCA by DT is equal to RA plus drug times Q divided by V. Okay, so RA, this is what you derive from the tutorial. The only thing you're going to do new now is you're going to add this additional term to account for this drug coming in. But Q is a special function. Q is zero. There's no flow into the battery active for most of the time. Only at these small little points in time will you spike up and spike down again. Okay, so you can simulate that then in polymath using the same idea as the if-else function. You could write if time t is greater than 3.95 but less than 4.05, q is equal to 1, else q is equal to 0. And that will simulate the person taking that drug and it's the equivalent of adding 300 milligrams into the batch. Okay, so what you should end up getting then are plots along the lines of something that looks like this. Okay, so here I'm simulating the person taking the drug. So there's C, CA is in blue. So the initial drug comes down. And then at time four hours, they take the drug so it goes into their stomach to a high concentration and goes down. CV spikes up again. So the, the aim for you to find in this tutorial is how frequently should this person be taking the drug and how many drug doses should they be taking? Is it one dose or two dose to maintain that concentration in the required balance? So you're not overdosing and you're not underdosing. Okay, so that's part of the, the third or fourth part of the tutorial for you to look at. So I'm just giving you one way to do it, Nicole suggested another way. When you simulate from time zero to your particular trigger point, you stop your simulation, and you repeat it, and you add your glass together. Okay, so you make your final conditions from the previous simulation, you make those the initial conditions for your second simulation. Okay, so those are just uh, some ideas to work through there. I'll take up the question, or sorry, the example we were considering last, time, last class on the CSTR. And we were consider concerned in there with the comparison between the batch reactor and the CSTR. step in our plan was to write up the design equation for the system. So the CSTR, the volume, was equal to Fj0 minus Fj divided by minus Rj. And we spent some time in the previous class showing that that's equivalent to the space time in the reactor tau, which is equal to V over Q, is equal to Ca0 minus Ca over minus Ra. Okay, so that's uh, what we spent a significant amount of time last class talking about. We then had three equations up on the board that I asked you to consider. C is equal to CA0, 1 plus K1 tau. That shows how concentration changes depending on the particular tau we select for the CSTR. We also had CB is equal to tau K1 CA. Tau K1 CA 1 plus K2 tau to the minus 1 as well. And then CC is equal to tau K2 CB. So 
those are the three equations we had. Recall we had three equations but four unknowns. So my, my unknowns are CA, CB, CC, and to try and create a square system, I, I will simply specify tau and we'll solve these equations at different values of tau and see what is the optimal tau, what is, in other words, what is the optimal space time to use in the reactor so that we get the maximum concentration of B. Did anyone get a chance to try it out, perhaps? I know you've probably been busy this week with other things. No. Okay, so there's just a, the, the objectives were really to calculate the overall selectivity. The overall yield. I'll put up here when we looked at the batch situation. So that polymath code is on the website. We calculate the overall selectivity is 2.28, the overall yield is 0.69, and the conversion is 0.78. <coughs> one of the concerns we had is well, would the CSTR perform any better or worse? So let's find the conditions for the CSTR that will give us the best selectivity for the conversion. And what we, what we looked at here, sorry, the batch, just to make a note here, this was at, we had to run the batch for the time, it was 3.05 hours. Okay, so the idea was in that we showed the last class, if we run the batch for 3.05 hours, uh, we'll get the best CD. What we're interested in now for the CSTR is what should that tau be to get the maximum CD. So if you take a look at MATLAB code for this, um, it's fairly straightforward. Again, I'll post this online so you don't need to, to copy it down. Essentially, we simulate tau over a range of values. I've gone from 0 to 10 in increments of 0.05. So I've created a vector there. I've specified CA0, K1, and K2 values. And then I write vector forms of those three equations over there. So CA0 divided by 1 plus K1 tau, CB and CC equations are over there as well. I've also added in the equations for selectivity, yield, and conversion. So these three four quantities we wanted to calculate, I've defined what they are um, over here. So the idea is, as I've said, to find the maximum concentration of CB. So what we can do is uh, run those run that code up to this point where I plot on a single curve then tau versus C A C B C C. So here's the first guy that shows over this range of tau values going from 0 to 10. C B is the line in green. Okay, I don't have a legend here, but so C A was blue, green here is C B and red is C C. So the peak of C B is somewhere over here. Also, coincidentally, this is totally coincidental, it's around tau equals 3. Okay, so it's not time, this is tau, it's the, the space time in the reactor, B divided by Q. So, in fact, the maximum is 3.15. How do you find that? Well, uh, simply go write out what the CB vector is, so max of CB is 0.7505, and then let's just take a look along the CB vector, 0.7505 occurs Actually, yeah, it's right over here, so position 64. So, so position 64 in the vector corresponds to tau 64 is 3.15 hours. So the best CS or the highest CD is tau is 3.15 hours. So tau is equal to V over Q. It means that I can fairly arbitrarily choose either the volume of the CSTR or the flow rate into the CSTR. As long as I pick the ratio of those two values to give me a value of 3.15 over here, I'm going to get the map of the most CBD. Okay, and this is 
this is good because in most companies, your boss, you might be constrained to produce a certain quantity of material per unit time. So by the end of the week, you need to produce a certain amount of product. So that will define what Q is. So then your only option is to vary. Or you might have a fixed reactor that you have to use, and then you just adjust Q. Either way, you at least have two, two variables to alter here to get to your optimal. Okay, and then you can calculate this at these, at these um, conditions here. You would get a selectivity of 1.58. You would get 0.61 for your overall yield, and your conversion is 0.61. Oh, sorry, 0.61, 0.61. Okay, so which which system would you prefer to use? Match. So you get higher selectivities, higher yields. We'd say last class, those two are the two variables that define your profit. So your economic profitability for your process is dependent on maximizing selectivity and yield. Conversion is, is almost always a trade-off between those two. This there's actually a nice way we can illustrate that over here. If I take a look at this graph of conversion against tau, and then this graph of yield against tau. So this graph tells me yield against tau is to run with as low a tau value as possible, and I'll maximize my yields. Conversely, the conversion against tau tells me to run at high values of space time, to get higher and higher conversions. Okay, so so we know that. That makes absolute sense to us. Let's just take a look at that definition of tau is equal to V over Q. It says high values of tau will give me high conversions. So in other words, use a large reactor with a slow flow rate coming in. So that, that makes intuitive sense to us. If I've got a large volume and slow flows, it's got materials with longer times that are spent in the reactor to react. And that's exactly what tau is. It's the time to treat one volume of reactor. So the longer that time is, the more or the greater the conversion I will get. Okay, so this is important. The reason why I'm going through this fairly slowly is, remember we have those multiple steps in the, our, our process? There's always the last two steps, to check your answer and to generalize. That's what I've been doing over here in this discussion, is checking and generalizing. Do I understand this? Do my answers make intuitive sense to me? Okay, so don't. Uh, don't just get the result of the curves and stop over there. Let's actually spend some time and figure out, well, do these numbers make sense and what alternative do I have? Yeah. What about operating costs for like the few um, reactors? Like, would in general like, take less than a huge amount of mass reactor to move by the two reactors? Okay, so uh, the question is here is on energy. These two reactors are both isothermal, so they're both operating at the same temperatures. We haven't taken temperatures. That's coming up next week to start looking at temperatures. But it does raise another interesting issue. From an operations point of view, which is an easier reactor to operate. Batch or CSTR? So you're saying CSTR? You set it and forget it. You put the pump on, you leave it, and you walk away. You can turn the lights on. Perhaps you need an operator to open the valves, close the valves, empty it out, clean it out, start it up again. So manpower intensive. All the industries that are running batch are trying to convert their processes over to continuous. Okay, so for those of you that work in small specialty chemical processes, guaranteed some of the issues you will be facing over the next 10 years as how do you convert your process over from batch to CSTR. Economically, you can almost always show that CSTR is more favorable in terms of economics. Okay? But these companies that produce small amount of products are really, really struggling to convert the reactors over from batch to CSTR. Okay, so this material you're learning in this course is showing you how exactly how to do this. It's a great and interesting challenge. Um, if I hadn't been working here at Mac, this is what I would have been working on in the pharmaceutical industry.
pretty much today. Uh, was one of the next projects coming down the pipeline to look at, was how to convert our batch processes over to CMTR because they're much, much easier to, to operate. So that brings the next question. This conversion here is lower, but if I still want to operate with the CSTR, what are my options? What can I do? And this yield is also lower, but by not very much. Okay, so that's interesting. It's telling me I'm close to getting to batch. Batch is expensive to operate from overhead. The CSTR, let's go look back at that yield curve. Yield decreases as I go to longer and longer towers. Is times 3.15? Why not a PFR? We'll take a look at a PFR next. So 3.15 hours, I could simply just go to slightly smaller towers and I could get that conversion up to 0.69. So pretty much there's a conversion of 0.69 at about 2 point something tau. So with a very small difference in tau, so I, it says drop tau. How can I drop tau? Well, I use smaller volumes or slightly higher flow rates, I can basically get similar performance to the batch reactor. Okay, but there's a trade-off here. The moment I go to smaller towels, my conversion is going to drop off as well. Instead of getting a conversion of 0.61, at around 2 on this curve, I'm going to get conversions of about 50%. So I, it's never a freebie. Right? So I'm going to sacrifice something for something. Yeah, in this case, I'm going to get yields that are comparable to the batch process, at the expense of lower conversions. Economically, that still may be more feasible to use a CSTR than a batch process. So my labor costs are pretty intensive in most companies. My separation costs to separate A from B due to lower conversion might be okay. Um, can you just like, increase volume and flow rate? Like your cow would be the same, but you'll be producing more products? Yeah, that's exactly why we use towers, to recognize that those two never trade off. But you will still be getting the same concentration. Right, so the aim is to get max CD. So if I increase B and Q, I haven't moved anywhere on the curve. I'm still at the same point on the curve. But yeah, so that, that's why we use tau, is because we always have two degrees of freedom. And this brings it down to one degree of freedom. Okay, so the next question was, why don't we use a PFR? Let's take a look at that. Um, this is a, that was a good question, actually. Fogler is unfortunately pretty ridiculous on this point because he kind of says PFRs are the same as batch, but doesn't show you why or how. Let's take a look at that for a minute and then we move on. So PFR, the design equation, is DFA by DB. RA for a PFR. Okay, let's just recall actually for a batch reactor, it's DCA by the T is RA for batch. Okay, so Volker says in a PFR, results are the same as in a batch reactor if we replace T with tau. Well, what does he mean by that? If we replace T with tau, he says take the batch equation, replace T with tau. Well, we haven't got a tau here in the PFR. Okay, we, well, we could have, but let's take a look at it a bit more carefully. So one way to do that is to recognize that FA is equal to CA times Q. So this isn't in his textbook. Let's just uh, uh, get this down so we can understand what it means. So DFA then, is equal to DCA times Q for constant flow rates Q. So if I substitute that into the PFR equation, I would get Q times DCA by DB is equal to RA. Now there's another issue here, tau tau is equal to V over Q, or I can write that as V is equal to tau times Q. And I can't do anything from this. So then dV is equal to d tau times Q. So let's substitute that in, into this expression over here. That's equal to then Q times 
ACA is the numerator, the denominator is GB. I can replace that by the tau times tau. cross out and I'm left with DCA by the tau is equal to RA. And notice that that's exactly the same expression as a batch reactor. So what Fogler says is true, take your batch expression and replace T with tau and it's the same as a PFR. But he doesn't tell you why that's true. Okay, so here's the derivation for why that's true. So really, by doing this analysis for batch versus CSTR, I have done all the work for all three reactors. I don't need to repeat all the analysis for the batch, uh, for a PFR because I can take the results from my batch reactor and those would be the same results as for the PFR. Okay, just one thing to recognize for a PFR, so we've got flow coming in, Q over here, and Q leaving, V is the volume of your PFR. So tau then is defining exactly the same way. The volume of the PFR divided. So if, the, if a batch operates in the same way as a PFR gets shown on the board, why would you why would you need a batch reactor? Why couldn't you just go straight to a PFR? Packing materials could be more expensive. Depends on the catalyst. What if it, you don't use a catalyst? It's just an empty pipe. Does size, does size matter? Um, v, Q, you've got a PFR, you've got the volume of your PFR, we're all, all we're interested here is tau. So if I've got a fixed PFR, I can simply change Q up or down to get the tau to match. Other, other thoughts on PFR versus a batch? Okay, so there, there might be pressure drop issues around the PFR, so energy costs there. How would you clean your PFR? Would you need to clean your PFR even? The main issues really come down to one of reactions that require heat inputs. It's easier to heat the batch because there's just a, a shell or uh, heat exchanger and coils inside the batch reactor. But a PFR, you've got cladding around the pipe, and if that pipe is pretty long, your heat transfer surface area might be pretty big. So the cost to heat and cool, heat or cool, or heat and cool in some situations, uh, a, a PFR might be prepared. Other issues around it are, in many cases, batches are not just, you don't just add your material, turn on the mixer, and turn it off after a period of time. Most batches have a recipe of multiple stages. So there's a heating stage, followed by a mixing stage, and then maybe you add some more material into it, then you cool down, then you mix again. I've seen recipes that are on the order of 30 to 40 steps, depending on the complexity of the material you're making. So for those reasons, you'll see, still see batch reactors for many, many years. But it's batch systems where the complexity of the recipe is very low, where you've got maybe one or two or four steps, that you can easily substitute a CSTR for that. And there are a good number of batch processes where that is the case. The reason why companies use batch processes, what might be some of the reasons you think companies use batch processes? It's a really expensive product, small quantities usually. I don't know. You can um, like create it more Right, so uh, for products that have um, that you don't need continuously produce, that you can stockpile for a while, 
that the market demand might be fluctuating. What sort of products are those? Pharmaceuticals. So, for example, the flu vaccine is made, um, made actually during July time frame to October, and they, they don't make that for a long period of time. In that tracks. Yeah, and also ones that might like PK or um, decompose like over time. Right, so if you're not using it right away and you have to store it and it might decompose. Another case might be that your raw material that you're using, you get those in batches from your supplier. So most companies don't have a pipeline to their raw material supplier that's continuously feeding raw materials to them. So they, by their nature, they're getting their raw materials in batch mode, so they will operate in batch mode themselves. Unless they've got like a small uh, silo or a storage unit to keep an inventory in, and they get a truck or two coming in. So that's typical. Most companies have a rail car coming in every day or two to deliver new raw materials. Those companies can operate in continuous mode. But if you're getting your raw materials coming in periodically, then you operate periodically yourself. Another reason why is actually from historical that most of these reactions are developed by chemistry type people with chemistry backgrounds. And what's a batch reactor is nothing more than a scaled up lab. So their thinking is batch. You've never gone, never ever in your life you've been into a chemistry lab and you see something operating continuously, right? It's always batch. Batch distillation, batch production of chemicals. So their whole methodology and way of thinking is batch. They don't think continuously. So it's, <laughs> they do, but um, they don't think continuously. So, the approach to making those products, very often in pharmaceutical industries, it's simply just a scaled up laboratory. Okay, so that, that thinking comes from there. Uh, just a final point, um, I did want to go into another example this evening, but there's a uh, little bit of time there. There was just a, a question that came up last class on what are typical uh, time constants, or sorry, I should say space time values here. So let's just take a note of that um, for reference. This will be good for you in your projects where you decide to size your plug flow reactors. So we said, we said last time tau is equal to space time, which is the time to process one reactor volume of fluid. Finally, a product flow 
reactor. These are in the order of resonance times of about half a second to um, about one hour. Again, one hour is it's really on the very long side for a resonance time of about a second. But the theory of producing products in the order of about 50 to uh, 5 million tons of